All right, for everyone who's logging in now for the first time, welcome. This is Joel with AdWorks, and we have Joey Barr, who is presenting uh, explicit direct instruction, sort of that administration. Hello, good morning, everyone. Happy Friday. First of all, I'll introduce myself. My name is Joe Ibarra. I'm the lead um, educational consultant for DataWorks, DataWorks uh, <laughs> in Australia and in the United States as well. Um, I've been working with Australian schools for the last eight years now. And, um, you know, I started, you know, Australia work was just such a real coincidence how this evolved. I was invited to do two weeks of presentations. I, uh, uh, John Hollingsworth, Sylvia Barr, and myself, we spoke for two weeks um, at, in Australia. And in those two weeks, we got a contract to write curriculum. Um, there was a government grant. They asked us to do EDI training and to train about 12 schools. And with those 12 schools, it just springboarded and we made co connections and contacts. And, you know, next thing we knew, we were in Australia and I was working there four times a year for four to six weeks at a time. Um, and we've had a lot of wonderful successes. Um, you know, uh, uh, I think uh, Ross had mentioned the one uh, school that you're familiar with is Elizabeth Vale. And that's a school we just really started working with. Uh, Chris Guy came, she saw a workshop in South Adelaide and we made a connection and we started working with their staff in explicit direct instruction. Um, so yeah, we've been, I've been very fortunate to, to work with a lot of wonderful schools and leaders throughout Australia. Hey, Joe, uh, is, is, that, is, that, is Chris Guy here? Oh, she's here, Joe, she's here. She's in the audience. Okay, so. <laughs> very cool, very cool. <laughs> that being said, Let's go over in an hour and a half, an hour and 20 minutes now. Um, yeah, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about um, just what is EDI? Uh, what do we, what is DataWorks? Remember, the, uh, the reason we even had any type of access or interest from Australia is from our book, uh, Explicit Direct Instruction. Uh, we wrote a book about 18 years ago, our first edition. And we've written a second edition, and that has drawn interest. And uh, uh, a lot of people have referred to that book and asked us to teach them more in depth about the strategies. Um, that being said, there's also seems to be a groundswell or a movement towards explicit instruction in Australia. Um, the pendulum seems to be switching a little, even New South Wales. I was talking with some leaders, instructional leaders, in New South Wales and the curriculum standards are now mandating that reading be taught explicitly, you know? Um, but what I have learned is explicit instruction can be a very generic, ambiguous term. Um, what do we mean by explicit instruction? Well, explicit direct instruction, if you can notice here, it is copyrighted uh, and uh, we develop this pedagogy, and it does have specific criteria of what it should look like. And hopefully be, uh, by the end of this workshop, you have some ideas of what I mean by that. That being said, we do understand, we're very interested in how the brain retains information. So we work very closely with a lot of cognitive uh, brain scientists on how, how does memory work? How does the brain retain information? And how can we transfer that into teaching strategies? Uh, and one thing we consistently go back and find is learners need to be engaged. There needs to be some type of engagement with the learners. We cannot have passive learners, especially with one teacher speaking the whole time or one presenter speaking to you the whole time. How do we engage our students? The person who is talking is the person who's processing information. Uh, we have to have multiple pathways to the brain. So how can our instruction uh, lead to that? So that being said, one of our first slides I like to show is one of the first researchers we cited, okay? Even though we are alone or most of us in small groups and we're all readers, I will ask you to read with me. I'm not asking you to read. You'll see why we ask our students to read. It's to support their reading fluency, 
but I'm asking my participants to read because it's a multiple pathway to your brain because we're not all auditory learners. So at home, you, I, I hope you will read this with me, with me even though I won't hear you. But please read this with me when, uh, when we read it together. One, two, three. I hear and I forget. I see and I remember. I do and I understand. Confucius. Okay. He understood how we retain, humans retain information. Okay, I hear and I forget. That's very important that we understand that we very, a very small percentage of us are auditory learners. In fact, we use all modal modalities of learning. And we need to connect them all, okay? So if we're talking to our, our, our uh, students the whole time, it's very difficult for them to retain information, okay? The next step is I see and I remember. So not only do we have to hear information, but we have to see to make a connection. So you'll see me talking about giving students academic definitions, but then with multiple, multiple examples. That's how they can contextualize. And then finally, this is the top tier of Bloom's taxonomy. This is true understanding. I do and I understand. That's when I understand a student really understands what I'm teaching. That's when I know a student really understands what I'm teaching them. If can I teach a student a concept and uh, can that student create that concept? Okay. Let me give you just a quick example of all three of these. Okay. I hear and I forget. I can tell my students, students, a character is a person, animal, or thing in a story. And this is reception age, year one age student. Okay. Uh, students, a character is a person, animal, or thing in a story. And a character talks or does something. And that's the information I give them. But then I ask them, what's a character? It's going to be very tough to recall. Okay. But I can, again, give them that same definition. Students, a character is a person, animal, or thing in a story that talks or does something. In fact, let me show you examples of a character in a story. There's a little girl. She's a person. See, that's a person. And she's crying, so she's doing something. That's a character in my story. There's a frog. That's an animal. And he's dancing, so he's doing something that a person does. And he's talking in my story. That is a character in my story, not a character. There's a ball in this story, which is a thing, but it doesn't talk or do something. That's a character in my story. Now, students, can you understand? I see and I understand. And what is the highest level of Bloom's taxonomy when we understand this? And my reception or year one age students can now write a story and tell me why the character in their story or the, uh, the talking dog is a character. That's when they truly understand that. And that's where we want our students to get. And you'll see, because that is the premise uh, one of the biggest uh, premises of EDI is the type of questions we ask our students. That being said, that's why I try to make our workshops um, to have some type of uh, uh, participation by our learners, even through Zoom. And that's been a challenge, um, but we can hopefully try to uh, create some. So the way I will do it, we were asked, we asked if possible, if you could be in groups of two to three, because I will ask you to pair share. So please be prepared to pair share. I also have random selecting uh, 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 a random selector cube here where I can randomly select a number and I will call on a square because I'm checking for understanding. I want to see how well you understand the information I had. So please be, re be prepared to unmute yourself and uh, discuss some of the topics we've been discussing. And uh, lastly, we also check for understanding through whiteboards. So hopefully we have whiteboards at home. We were asked to have whiteboards and I can see your whiteboards uh, so I can make decisions. The strategies we hope our teachers to use in their classrooms will be the same strategies I hope to incorporate throughout this workshop with, uh, with you as adults, with uh, as administrators, because that's another key component of EDI. We're constantly checking for understanding in real time in form, checking for formative assessment to, to make decisions, to modify, to, to give corrective feedback that's appropriate for how well a student understands the information. Okay, so <clears throat> let's move on. For instructional leaders, we 
uh, want to understand, there's a lot of uh, uh, what we're hoping our instructional leaders are sure of is why we're implementing this. What is, the, what, what is the reason we would even want to implement this type of pedagogy or this type of strategy? So first, <clears throat> what do instructional leaders have to have? So everyone, please read this with me. One, two, three. Maintain a relentless focus on improving how students are taught. Um, this is important. And this is, we've seen this firsthand. Um, when our company started, we did not do professional development. We did not train teachers in any capacity. What we did was we analyzed information. We were curriculum calibrators. Now, what that means is schools could give us, in fact, uh, schools could give us their sample material and we could tell you what grade level that material was because we understood curriculum very well. We understood uh, the standards, the Australian standards, the, whatever country we've worked with, uh, we, we can understand the standards. In fact, we write learning objectives for that standard to make sure the material is on grade level. The next thing we were able to do as a company, we were able to analyze, um, we, could, we could look at a school's performance and we could help them uh, divide their results into subgroups. So I could tell you what your English learners and how they were performing, or I could tell you what your English only we're performing. And here we call them uh, free lunch. Free lunch means lower socioeconomics. So we could tell you where you could apply resources. Uh, but it was always the end result, the same results. Okay. In fact, it got to a point, if you told me the socioeconomics of a neighborhood um, and where that school was located, what the average incomes were for the households and what the average price of the houses were, I could tell you test results without looking at the test results. What we saw that could make a change was effective teaching. That was the key. It's like, and, we, and that's where we got together to decide, let's create a pedagogy uh, that can support teachers in, infect in effective teaching. Uh, in Australia, Hattie's you know, huge. We've off, off, obviously looked at a lot of his work, but in the US, we had a Rosenshine that we followed. He just looked at, he was a researcher that looked at a lot of, a lot of meta-analysis studies of what effective teaching strategies were effective teachers using. And that's how we developed explicit direct instruction. Uh, these are the effective stra strategies teachers continually seem to use. A lot of engagement, um, a lot of corrective feedback, ch checking for understanding in real time, teaching first, okay? And that's how we develop what we did. So if you truly want to make a difference at your school, one of the most important is the quality of the teaching in that school, okay? The next is an instructional leader should focus on the instructional program. Okay. This is really important. Uh, I've worked with some, teach, uh, some principals throughout Australia and they've had some really wonderful results and it's been impressive and they believed in what they wanted to implement. Um, they understood it. They knew what EDI was. They knew what it looked like. They knew what the engagement norms, how they should be used, and they wanted to support their teachers. Um, you know, a, a couple examples would be Blue Haven, Paul McDermott at Blue Haven in New South Wales. Um, you know, we started with them four years ago. That school, Blue Haven, is in one of the lowest socioeconomic areas of uh, New South Wales. Uh, a lot of external factors for that school to perform at low levels. Um, a lot of uh, uh, trauma in the household, a lot of substance abuse issues, low socioeconomics. Um, and Blue Haven, when Paul came in, was at the bottom 5% of all schools, performing at the bottom 5% of all schools in Australia. And with implementation, of a solid pedagogy of explicit direct instruction, but with a lot, one piece of the puzzle, community outreach, um, uh, 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 a behavior management, a uh, school-wide program implementation and leadership, he took Blue Haven from the bottom 5% to the top 10% of all schools in Australia. They became the school of the year, I think two years ago. Uh, Tim Shields, uh, 
Uh, he's from ACC Singleton. We work very closely with him. Um, you know, uh, so we've had these experiences with these principles. And um, if you have, if you need some more references, please contact them. They will hopefully give you. Uh, will explain to you their experience working with us and the results that they saw with their students. So focusing on the instructional program. And then lastly, uh, number three, we wanna close the implementation gap and ultimately the achievement gap, okay? The achievement gap, uh, the implementation gap refers to the percentage of, the, of, of teachers at your school who are effectively uh, delivering instruction, okay? And we wanna make sure we're effective because the more, uh, uh, if you have over 80 to 90% of your teachers effectively uh, uh, delivering instruction, you have huge leaps and bounds. And that's going to ultimately close the achievement gap. Because we do see, like I said, it's very clear socioeconomics has a huge uh, impact for, for multiple reasons on performance. And so why is there such a gap between schools. Well, how do we close that gap? And through instruction, we're able to do that. So what are some of the things we can do? Read with me, one, two, three. Breakthrough schools <clears throat> have high profile instructional leaders who, number one, articulate a coherent instructional vision. Okay. This is really uh, important on what is your vision for your staff and for your school and for the reason why. And it's hopefully the reason is for, uh, to support your students. Um, that being said, understanding the pedagogy you want your teachers to use uh, is extremely important. You need to understand what it looks like in the classroom. You need to be able to give specific feedback to those teachers and more importantly, uh, support so you can, um, uh, uh, um, get that implementation because it's not just vague, ambiguous terms like we're going to be a cohesive school. And of course, we have those statements. We're going to be a cohesive school and we're going to, um, um, you know, work with the community. Yes, I understand those, but we want to be very specific with our vision. Okay. So an EDI driven school would be we're going to implement explicit direct instruction that shows student engagement through the engagement norms, where they're constantly pair sharing, where they're constantly tracking and reading with students to promote their reading fluency, where teachers are checking for understanding in real time and, and teachers are asking students higher order questions with grade level work. That's the feedback we want and that's the vision you, you wanna share with your staff. Um, number two, you wanna clarify that implementation is an expectation, not a choice. Um, you know, look, it's very important. We are all professionals, especially your staff and your teachers, and this is a team effort, but there has to be a clear vision and a clear movement of what's going to make this work. It's like, look, we all have to be on board. This is my vision as a leader. And more importantly, if you have that vision, what is the support you can have for your teachers, so your expectations, um, so your um, expectations can be met. Okay, so that vision has to be clear, and um, and yes, we want feedback from your teachers. What does it look like? How's that? So we always, when I work with teachers, you know, I always tell the the administrators, have your teachers discuss with you how this is going because we need buy-in, and if they understand what the results and how it's affecting their students, we will get buy-in. And, and number three, this is one, uh, one of our important ones, observe instruction and what can the leader say? They can recognize and name the research-based strategy that teachers use. Oh, I see this teacher is tracking and reading with, with their students. That's supporting their reading fluency. I see that teacher is pair sharing higher order questions. That's, that's, uh, that's helping the students process information. Um, can they give criteria reference feedback? And we're gonna talk about that because I will show you what EDI should look like. And can they give, provide real-time feedback? 
we're really big in real time feedback. In fact, when we coach, we do elbow to elbow coaching. We co-teach and co co-teach with teachers we're coaching because we switch off and we'll give them feedback right there. Uh, we feel it's much more beneficial to give that feedback in real time as opposed to write it out on a paper where the teacher refers to it at another time. That's how we give feedback to our students when we're teaching them year level content. That's how we give feedback to our teachers when we're coaching them in real time. Okay, so we've gone over a lot. Um, maintaining a relentless focus on improving how students are taught. It's the quality of your teaching. That makes the biggest difference. Uh, that's, they are on the ground floor. Focusing on the instructional program. What is your vision for your school? Um, how do you close that implementation gap? And ultimately the achievement gap. That's going to happen through 90% implementation by supporting teachers. Uh, what does it mean to articulate a coherent instructional vision, a specific one, you know, and clarify that implementation is an expectation, not a choice. And then this is a really important one. What kind of feedback can you give your teachers? Can you give them specific feedback on the pedagogy you believe they should be uh, implementing? So go ahead, take a minute to talk with each other. Pick any of these. This is number one, number two, number three, number four. Pick any of these bullet points and say, you know, um, I'll give you an example. You know, uh, yes, I'm really interested in focus on the instructional program. I, I've got to remember, look, as a principal, there's so many hats I wear. I've got to do the budget. I've got to make sure my resources are properly alloc allocated. I deal with parents. I deal with it. I did, but I also have to remember instruction is going to be uh, how can I make a focus on instruction as well? So that would be an example of how you could respond to that. Go ahead, take a second to pick any bullet point, talk with each other, and be ready to share out. Uh, what does it mean to you to be an instructional leader to get your vision put across to your uh, teachers? Go ahead. Pair share with each other. Okay, if I can get you back, I'll see if I can have someone share. Uh, let's start with the Mary, Kristen, Belinda, and Jay group. Can you share anything that you saw uh, here that uh, you took note of? It would be at the Mary, Kristen, Belinda, Jay group. Hi, sorry, we didn't uh, see that you're talking to us. <laughs> um, no okay. Um, we just had a discussion about the doc point about ensure consistent implementation across all classrooms. Um, we're a preschool setting, so that means for us, our early childhood educators, um, sometimes they don't understand the why um, behind things that we do. So I think it's about ensuring that we're having those discussions with them. Yeah, you know, and even as a preschool, look, I mean, a lot of it uh, in what year, how old are your students? Three to four, three and four year olds? They three and four. Three and four year olds. Obviously, a lot of it is just socializing. Obviously, a lot of it is social, classroom social norms. How, what does it mean to now be in a classroom setting? What does it mean to, you know, there's a lot, what, learning motor skills. You know, there's a lot we can, uh, we're learning at that age, but you can also start putting in an instructional goal of some of the sounds you want your students to learn. And some of the skills you want your students to learn, because that can be, you know, if we start reading is one of the most important skills that our students are going to, to have that we can get to them. And the earlier we can start with them, teaching them reading, reading through a strong, I mean, it's research says a strong systematic phonics program and teaching them the sound phonics, phonemic awareness, identifying the letters, we can start at that age and making sure you're Teachers understand that even at that age group, okay? All right, um, <clears throat> we have a lot of participants. I do like um, questions. I'm not gonna call on too many. So please, if there's a question, please call out. There's a lot of you on my screen. So I might not see a handout. So if you unmute yourself, say, yeah, I've got a quick question. Please feel free to um, call out. 
no questions right now. Okay. And you know, some of the things we ask our leaders is participate in trainings. Understand the pedagogy you're asking your teachers to implement. Okay. Um, you know, obviously we're gonna be talking about EDI, but this is for, for any pedagogy. Uh, understand what it should look like. Um, so, and I, and I do respect an, a, an instructional leader's time and how many hats and roles you play, but understanding that instruction is key. So you, when you see it, you know it and you understand in the classrooms. Um, we're trying to ensure consistent implementation across all classrooms. Um, yes, you know, it's, you know, we see, um, <laughs> we see it all the time with, um, you know, um, uh, you know, the impact that a, the impact that an effective teacher can have on their students is, is huge. You know, they can take them up, you know, 1.2 1. 1. over a grade level of growth. And it's extremely important. It's just, it, we see the impact of, of effective instructional teaching. And at the same flip of the coin, you know, the impact that an ineffective teacher sometimes can be tough as well, because you don't see that growth in that year. Um, so we want to get those, those teachers that support to make sure they're all uh, consistent through all classrooms. And it not only goes through effective teaching, it also goes through year understanding curriculum. Are they teaching grade level content? Okay, so we'll talk about that. And we advocate for students and support our, our teachers. So we talked about this. We started with student achievement by analyzing learning. It was output. We looked at results. We were very good at understanding standardized tests. I can look at almost any question in a standardized test without knowing the year level. And I can tell you eventually what year level that question is from and what standard. That's what I did for this company in the beginning. We calibrated curriculum and we knew results, but that was output. We switched, we switched to the teaching process and we analyzed, we were measuring teaching, okay? We wanna see what uh, the success of our teachers. That was the uh, key shift for DataWorks, all right? And here's just a quick little, um, really, it's just a quick little, uh, maybe joke, but let's see what you think about it. Uh, everyone take a second to read this, please. One, two, three. It's just the, uh, something that I always just smile at. And the point of it is, yes, sometimes we're, we need information. I do need to see where my students are, uh, but it's the quality of the instruction that will really help them and support them. Okay, <laughs> so there's four things that we really um, want to um, make sure we see in our classroom. Okay, um, if you want true um, reform, here are the four areas you really wanna see uh, working in your classroom and you should understand them. Number one is alignment to standards. 90% of the teachers having 90% of assignments on grade level. Assignments meet testing rigor, okay? What is the material? What is the content your teachers are teaching? Are they teaching year level content? Because that, if you do wanna see growth uh, in your, uh, performance, academic performance index, it's are we teaching the curriculum that will be assessed through a NAPLIN or through some standardized test? Because I'll give you a quick example. We worked with a state, uh, South Carolina, 95% of the schools in the state. And we work, we've been working them for years. But when we first initially started working, we found that the material teachers were giving their students was usually one and a half to two year levels below. And what's, what the problem with this is that eventually your, your students aren't working at year level content. So, um, 
so they don't have a chance to meet that year level content, especially when they're assessed on it. And what that means is very simply understanding the standard. Here's an example of a standard of curriculum. Uh, this is <clears throat> a third grade math lesson, okay? They're asking their students in year three to subtract 93 through minus 28. But let's be careful, okay? That's a second grade standard. You're asking your year threes to do that because um, <clears throat> Uh, in, in year two, add and subtract through 999, okay? In, by year three, students are expected to fluently subtract numbers to 1,000. So we're not, um, we're not giving them the curriculum that's at their year level. We see that a lot. Now, I will give you um, some more concrete examples and how we can teach year level concepts, even if there's some subskill errors. Next, the breadth of standards. Okay, uh, how many of the standards are being taught? Are we teaching the, the, the Australian, uh, you'd have obviously the South Australian. We have taken the Australian standards and broken them down. So we look at the breadth of standards. Is 90% of the teaching covering all the standards? Now we've come to change this a bit because what we found was we do have essential standards and universal standards. So to support teachers, because this can be overwhelming to educators, especially teachers in the classrooms, like, well, how can I teach all this curriculum? I'm focusing on delivery and how do I come up with this? And understanding curriculum can be very um, uh, confusing and ambiguous to actually understand. So to support teachers, what we've done is we give them standard alignment. So for year three, we can show you, these are, this is the Australian standards or curriculum you have 31 standards. We created 89 learning objectives to teach these standards because some of these standards have multiple learning objectives in them, okay? And we showed you the resources we have that teachers can use. And what it looks like specifically, this is cut and paste out of the Australian curriculum. Here's a standard. Understand that languages have different written and visual communication systems, different oral traditions and different ways of constructing meaning. Okay, so what exactly does a teacher year three can sometimes get confused? What do you want my students to learn? Well, what we did was wrote, write, we write teachable learning objectives, compare the meaning of signs and symbols in different cultures, recognize that stories are used to share cultural tra traditions. These are grade level learning objectives. No, after initial lesson, these objectives will be embedded in lessons throughout year three. Okay, how can you do it? And then we also tell you, do we have any resources in our lesson banks? Edusary, Edusary is our lesson bank that we have. And uh, uh, NAPLIN will tell you if this is represented in NAPLIN because we'll show you not only a universal standard, you know, we're looking for what's a universal standard and then we're also looking for high leverage standards as well. Then we'll look at this, a standard like this, understand that successful cooperation with others depends on shared use of social conventions, including turning, turn taking patterns and forms of address. Well, what exactly do you want your teachers to teach? Well, follow rules for collaboration. Uh, we're very good at writing these learning objectives. Google uses our learning objectives for the um, common core state standards. They're the United States common core standards. They've used our learning objectives because our common core standards were so ambiguous, we didn't know how to refine, Google didn't, couldn't even refine the search. So they use our learning objectives to show teachers what lessons they should be teaching. We did the same thing for Australia. Um, so now here we tell you, this is what a high uh, universal standard, examine how evaluative language can be varied. We give you the learning objective and we give you the resources. And then we'll point out to you this standard right here, understand how different types of text vary in use of language choices, depending on their purpose and context. These are five big learning objectives. Recognize the language features of narratives, procedures, reports, review, expositions. We have the lessons, or more importantly, you can have the lesson. If it's a, a well-written lesson, uh, make sure this is addressed because we do know NAPLIN really likes this standard and it will be represented in nine out of 51 questions. So this is what's known as a high leverage uh, standard because it should be addressed. So some are weighted by NAPLIN differently than others. 
So you can see the breakdown and you can now as educators say, hey, let's make sure we are addressing our key high leverage universal standards. And most of these are supporting students to what? To become better readers and better writers to begin with. That's one of the keys. Okay, so that's how we support teachers <clears throat> in the breadth of standards. And eventually we, we used to say, well, let, let's try to teach 90% of them. No, let's at least really hit the universal one strong. And then we can also, you know, supp the supplementary ones will be addressed as well. Uh, do we have time on task? Are the teachers, uh, the time on task on, on uh, the effectiveness of the teaching? And for me, look, I'm a classroom teacher. I'm a coach. Uh, that is my role for this company. And it's always been my passion. I like to be in the classroom. I do lesson demonstrations and uh, um, instructional effectiveness. How can I support teachers? to have more effective teaching strategies. And if we can combine these four, that's when you see real reform, okay? Effective reform requires 90% implementation. So talk with each other, tell each other, what are the differences between the, these four alignment to standards? Is your year three teacher teaching year three work or is this year two work or is it year one? And can you, will you be able to under, uh, see that? Breadth of standards, are we teaching essential standards? Are we teaching all the standards in the curriculum? Time on task, are teachers using their time to, to meet the needs of these students? And then instructional effectiveness. What are the differences? What are each of these and what are the differences between them? Talk to each other, pair share. Okay, 10 seconds. All right, um, let me see. I have a Rachel and Steph. Can you discuss any of these four areas? How are you going? We're from our preschool. So we were just talking about what the standards um, are in a preschool because they're quite open-ended. Mm. Um, so for the ELF, one of them might be children are effective communicators. So we normally teach to the developmental need rather than you know, it, it, yes, and, um, and, and yes, I do recall we have a lot of preschools joining us today. So this is a little bit more for foundation up to year 12. But I do know that in preschool, and I've seen and I've worked with a lot of uh, schools that have preschools or preschools themselves, they do have a vision of how, what they want taught to get these students to start reading. You know, what sounds they need to start working on? What letters? You know, a lot of it is motor skills. What can they, you know, start drawing or using crayons or that, you know, we do have those types of standards, what behavior standards and stuff. But it is, you know, we want to think about it because, I mean, that's one of the, you know, real powerful advantages an Australia has over the United States. We don't have strong preschool programs. They're usually private that we have to pay for ourselves. And that's, you know, that shows the gap, the widening gap between people. And because you have that advantage, I mean, it's, it's to me, it's extremely important to get those kids, you know, that, that beginning and that exposure. Okay. Any questions? Because I want to, you know, we don't have much time and I do want to show you what is EDI. What does it look like? And so you have an understanding. This was a little bit of more of what it means, uh, the leadership uh, goals that we have. But now I really do want to talk about what is EDI. If you read with me, one, two, three, explicit direct instruction is a research-based plan for creating and delivering well-designed and well-taught lessons. Well-designed, so how well that lesson is written and is it on grade level, and then delivery. Truthfully, Teachers should, their role should be delivery. You know, writing lessons and delivering lessons are two different skills. You need to understand both, but, you know, I, I'm a very good, I can deliver lessons. I'm, you know, I can connect to my students. I can connect to teachers and I can write lessons, but it's not my strength. You know, um, I can still do it. I'd much rather. 
And uh, so you have to understand, it's like, look, even great teachers, I mean, not great, that's effective teachers who are really strong in delivery, you know, they might have some problems with, the, uh, with design. Uh, so how do we, we, we find well-designed lessons and well-taught? And that, you know, I've seen very effective teachers deliver, but if the lesson's off, you know, we lose that impact. So how can we get those consistent lessons throughout the whole year level? Uh, grade level team. So number one, EDI is designed to produce at least 80% student success, then corrective feedback to 100%. So one of our main goals is getting information from our students in real time. I'm doing that by randomly selecting. So I'm going to use an example of 20 students in my class. So if I have a class of 20 students, um, I'm trying to get a sampling of it. When 80% of those 20 students, so that would be 16 of them, understand the material, or maybe even 15, they understand, I can move on. That's my pace, okay? I'm checking for understanding, and I'm like, okay, 15 out of 20 understand this material, I'm moving on. And the reason that number is important is because if I taught to 100% from the beginning, I would bore my high-performing students. But that is the beauty of EDI. It's giving you information. I understand very quickly who are my students who aren't uh, understanding the information. And I have support in class intervention when I'm teaching them during the lesson, pair sharing with them, uh, echoing with them until I do get that 100%. But that is the pace of what I want my lessons to look like. Okay. EDI, it wor works with all grade levels and disciplines. Um, this is just how the brain retains information. The brain retains information by engagement, by exposures, by repetitions, by multiple examples. I mean, we have a whole hour workshop on how the brain retains information. So from kindergartners up to adults to administrators I'm presenting to, and I've done it, oh, kindergarten, well, when I say kindergartners, I'm referring to uh, reception age and obviously even preschools. Will it look differently? Of course. Does the way I use um, gestures for year ones, reception year ones look different for high school? Uh, you better believe it, uh, but you'll see a modification. In fact, I'll show you right now. Number three, students learn concepts even if there are some sub-skill errors, okay? This is really important. Um, we talked about this, or I talked about this earlier. I have to make sure my students are exposed to year level content. Now, I will give you a uh, a full disclosure, my first uh, contract in Australia for three years was with Good to Great Schools Australia, uh, it's a, a no, no Pearson program, and he had a contract from the federal government to work with remote schools throughout Australia. It was a remote, uh, remote school funded program. So I went all over Australia. Um, and I can also, I can say I've probably been to most place, more places in Australia than most Australians. I know your country really, really well. And I can also honestly say I've almost been killed by almost all your animals. I've had shark experiences. I've had snake experiences and spider experiences. I've been in remote, remote areas. But where I'm going with this is some areas, um, you know, we would run into just, um, you know, I was working with year sevens who would be work, reading at a year one, year two level, that's really tough to teach them year seven material. But I could teach them year three, year four material. Um, it's usually about if my students are one to two year levels reading behind, I can teach them that grade level content. And what I mean by that, if I have a year three student, I can teach them year three concepts, but I substitute the sub skill. So usually in language and literacy, it's reading. It's their reading a level. So my year three might be reading at year one. I have to be very careful. In year one, you need to identify characters. That's the standard. In year two, you need to start comparing and contrasting characters. In year three, you can tell me what characters are like by what they say and do. It's the beginning of characterization. So if I have year three students and they're reading at year one, if I give them a year one story, they, they're not identifying characters. They're telling me what that character is like by what they say and do, okay? Even though I'm giving them a year one 
reading passage so they can still be exposed to year level concepts. I'll show you right now what this looks like for older kids. Our lessons are deceptively, if you don't know our lessons, they're deceptive, they look deceptively easy because you do not, under, you might not understand how we deliver them. So everyone take a second, let's just solve number one very quickly. Write the answer on your whiteboard. What is the answer to problem number one? Okay, if you don't have a whiteboard, show me with your hands. You can show me with your hands, okay. All right, I see a number two. Now I could go and ask a few students, and a, a, a few participants, everyone's two, two. In fact, if you're really good at this, numbers, you could do one through four, two, four, 10, 15, okay? But everyone, can you see my whiteboard? This is mirrored, okay? Empty square plus seven equals nine. Can you see that? That's a reception standard. If you can tell me the missing number of the box, that's two, you're doing reception age work, okay? So two is not year seven work, but I have year sevens who can't multiply sometimes and sometimes they can't do integers, but I can still conceptually teach them how to solve a one-step equation. And it would look something like this. It's all in the language we use, okay? All right, class, you are now my year sevens. And you might have problems with integers, which are negative numbers or, sub or, or multiplication. We're gonna, walk, we're gonna solve one step equations. Track with me, listen, I will read first. X plus seven equals nine. Your turn, X plus seven equals nine. I have a variable. I need to isolate my variable. To do that, I need to get rid of this constant. Seven is my constant. So I have plus seven. Everyone show me, how do I get rid of a constant? With an inverse operation, it will undo it. Everyone show me, one, two, three, or an inverse operation. So to get rid of plus seven, I use the opposite, which is minus seven. What I do to one side, I do to the other side. Everyone show me balanced equation. What I do to one side, I do to the other side. That will balance my equation. So now I will isolate my variable x and x will equal two. That's how you solve a one-step equation. I have x plus seven equals nine. I use the inverse operation of minus seven to get rid of the constant plus seven. What I do to one side, I do to the other side. My isolated variable is x equals two. With your partners, solve number two. There's three terms I wanna hear. I wanna hear isolated variable, inverse operation, balanced equation. Work with each other. Blah, 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 blah. That language makes this a year seven standard. That language, even though my students can see very easy numbers that they can subtract, they can conceptually understand how to solve for X. This is also an example of TAPL. I will teach first number one so they can successfully do number two, okay? This is what EDI is doing. We're trying to incorporate, so we're teaching, <clears throat> We're teaching year level concepts, even if there are some sub skills. How can we support them? Sometimes I have to give them calculators, but they still need to be exposed to year level content. And then lastly, we hope EDI increases motivation, improves attendance, encourages more students to turn in homework and reduces discipline problems. Look, <clears throat> I've seen this over and over, especially at some very difficult schools. Uh, one of the re biggest reasons students tend to act out, well, we have a lot of external factors. Those are beyond um, our walls of our classroom. Those are things that we have that students are dealing with. But how do we, um, how do we motivate our students? Well, we want to engage them. We want them to be successful. If they're successful and if they're accessing content by when we teach first, when we have a lot of engaging strategies, and they, they know they're supported, they're gonna, you're gonna increase their motivation. When, they can, when you know they can do the work independently and you give them that work independently, they're gonna wanna come to school um, 
In Australia, you don't do as much homework. You start doing it in the older grades, but it's very big here. Uh, it was huge for virtual learning. It was a lot of independent work. First of all, students don't learn by doing independent work. They don't learn a new concept when they're doing independent work. They're reinforcing an old learned concept. That's really important. Uh, so if you really want them to do independent work successfully, make sure you're checking for understanding in real time. So when they go and do that independent work, like homework, they're doing it successfully. Because if they're doing it incorrectly, it's actually more detrimental than beneficial. Okay. And hopefully if they're accessing the information curriculum, uh, you know, that's why a lot of us act out. You know, we don't want to feel silly or dumb, but if we're successful and if we're uh, accessing this information, we're more likely to participate productively. Okay. So take a second to talk about these. What are these four uh, uh, reasons that EDI addresses? It's designed to produce 80% student success because we're constantly checking for understanding in real time. And when 80% of my students understand it, I, that's the pace of my instruction. But I still know how I'm gonna support the 20% who's not. I, I'm, I'm keen and looking into them. Works with all grade levels and disciplines. This can be modified from reception age to high school age students. Students learn concepts, even if there are some sub-skill errors. I'm still giving them year level content. And then lastly, increases motivation, improves attendance, and encourages more students to turn in homework and reduces discipline problems. Choose one of these. On your whiteboard, you would either write one, you would write two, you would write three, or you write four. This is an example of explicit direct instruction. I've given you content, okay? I've given you examples of it. Now I'm asking you to think about an answer, and now I would have you pair share. That's what I'm doing with my students. Now you would pair share. I chose two because in that pair sharing helps you process what you're discussing. It'll reduce your anxiety because you get to practice your answers. You also get to hear someone's answers. So that's the whole process of EDI. That's how I'm trying to use it in this workshop as well. So go ahead and pair share with each other and be ready to show me which one you chose. One, two, three, and four. All right, show me with your whiteboards, either one, two, three, and four. Or you can show me with a number. How about David? David, I see you have two up there. Today, yes, uh, we, we chose two. Um, yeah, we think that um, having um, been working across all grade levels and also having um, um, composite classes, year threes and fours, year and fives and sixes, um, it's particularly appealing, um, I guess, from that point of view as well. That there's a lot of kids that are working at different levels just because it's the, uh, the set year level like year five. There's your normal bell curve of abilities through the, the class. So, yeah, that's why we chose two. You know, and, and let, me, let me give you some specific examples. This is going to segue into what I was going to show. Are there any questions on this section right now? Um, please speak up if there is. But let me show you what we mean by, I keep making the terms, engage your students. This is how we engage our students. This is what we want your teachers to be proficient in, okay? Uh, student engagement. Now, read with me, one, two, three. Student engagement is created when the teacher asks the students to do something. So we have these engagement norms, uh, and they all have a purpose. Pronounce with me. That is when I'm teaching my students how to pronounce one or two key phrases in a lesson. In fact, it's a preemptive analysis of my lesson. I scan my lesson and what's a high usage word that I think my students need to just practice pronouncing before I read. For example, if I was to teach this page to my students, there might be a lot of words that they might need support on, but engagement is one of the most important. It's usually the concept. So I would read it for my students first. Engagement. Okay, students, before we read this, let's look at this G and this G. In this is G, 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 say that. And this is G, G, G. You pronounce this G differently here. So I'm going to pronounce this word first. One, two, three. Engagement. Engagement. Your turn. Engagement. Engagement. Again, engagement. That's how you pronounce that word. 
Now we have track with me, read with me. That's when a teacher will read a sentence like a learning objective or a definition while the students track and follow, and then the students can successfully read it. Track with me, students, my turn. Student engagement is created when the teacher asks the students to do something. Your turn. Student engagement is created when the teacher asks the students to do something, okay? Track with me, read with me is supporting our students reading fluency so they can uh, get reading comprehension. It will help my non-readers to at least hear the concepts and definitions and learning objectives orally. Now we train our teachers what we track with me and read with me. We don't wanna be robots either, okay? It's usually the learning intention and some things we just read out loud, okay? And some things that are year level, we can orally read. So we make those decisions. We need repetitions. We need multiple exposures. This is a form of repetition. Track with me, one. Read with me, two. Okay, so we're getting those exposures that we do. But to help the, these first three are to help reading fluency. Uh, number two, uh, this one, gesture with me. It's a cognitive strategy where it stores more inform, it stores information in multiple ways. We teach teachers how to make appropriate gestures. Uh, a character is a person because I'm a person or animal or thing in a story. Characters talk or do something. That's a reception age uh, or year one age appropriate gesture. Year four, okay, context clues. I have an unknown word. Context clues are the nearby words because it's nearby to help you, under, uh, to help you know the meaning of the unknown word. Okay. Year seven, okay, inverse operate, very simple. Inverse operation will undo an operation, and then you need to balance the equation, okay? Convergent boundaries, boundaries that converge. Now, if we can't come up with a gesture, we, we want to support them with some type of cognitive strategy. Maybe um, it's an acronym. Maybe it's um, a numerator and denominator. Numerator has U for up. Denominator has D for down. So we talk about that. One of the most important uh, engagement norms that we have is pair share. Okay. This is when our students collaborate. And yes, you know, this has been very difficult to implement with COVID and COVID restrictions and uh, 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 distances and appropriate. So we have modified with schools are starting to use it and we're using it. And then we have another wave. So how we um, incorporate it, you know, we're going to have to make that decision according to the current outbreak or condition, but pair string is very powerful, okay? Because in EDI, we teach first with multiple examples, and then we ask a high order question. You're gonna see that, that's the next part of this, is the importance of the types of questions we ask. And then we have our students pair share. If I ask my students a thinking question, I want them to pair share, why? because every student will orally answer every question. We do not have, we do not ask a question and have students raise their hand. We ask, we pair share, we randomly select, and then we ask, are there any volunteers who want to add to this? Okay, this way we gauge our class. This way every student orally answers every question. Number two, automatic wait time is embedded. We need think time. A lot of students know the answer, they just need to, they're having problems articulating the answer. Listening and speaking is included. Student engagement improves because they, we are social beings that like to socialize. And this is one way we can do it, at, we can do academic socialization. Students remember more because we need repetitions and exposures to content. We can't just hear it once. We need to hear it once with the teacher teaches. We need to hear it a second time when our pair share partner tells it, the third time when we tell them, the fourth time when the teacher calls on someone. We need to get those exposures. Um, very important, increases the student talk to teacher talk ratio. Um, we find that in primary schools, teachers talk 60% of the time, while students 40% of the time divided by 20 of those students or 30. In high school, that goes up. It's very clear that the person who's talking is the person who's processing information. If you teach something to someone, they need to articulate it to someone, whether it's their pair share partner or to yourself. That's when they're learning that. So how do we increase that student talk to teacher talk ratio? 
Number seven, students practice their answers. We're trying to reduce anxiety. You know, it's very, teaching and learning creates anxiety, especially if you have to answer in a classroom setting in front of your peers. So by pair sharing, you practice your answer so you can uh, give it when you do answer, you've rehearsed it and it'll reduce your anxiety. Uh, provides language translation time. You hear questions in English, translated into your native language, think of the answer in your native language and then retranslate it back in English. We need more time for that. Uh, short attention spans address, uh, provides first reteach because they're reteaching each other. Instruction is more interactive and interesting. And, you know, there's a lot of reasons, but my, one of the most powerful, it reduces affective filter. An affective filter is when, you're, when the learner is so anxious and in, in a state of anxiety, they can't even think or recall. Your brain shuts down. So how do we reduce that anxiety? How do we reduce anxiety in our learners? First, we set a climate in our classrooms that it's a positive learning community. We're safe, we're protected, we're respected. Okay, we're asking for effort. Uh, next, we teach first with multiple uh, examples so everyone has a chance to access that information, not just the people who, answer, uh, who raise their hand. Next, we get to pair share where we get to hear and we get to discuss and that reduces anxiety. And also there are strategies where with whiteboards, we don't call on the wrong answers first. Even though I'm randomly selecting students, I fake the stick. This is a random sampling. To do true random sampling, you have to get rid of your outliers. So if I call on my lowest performing student randomly, I won't call on him first. I wanna get middle performing students to gauge my classroom. That's gonna give me understanding. I want, uh, eventually I'll fake it back to get that, to build the confidence in my lower performing group. So those are the reasons we pair share and we teach uh, how we talk about desk arrangement, strategic pairing, rotating the pairs, uh, label the students in pairs, and we train students to pair share and we provide an attention signal for students to immediately stop talking and face the teacher. Okay? Uh, attention signal, very straightforward. Whiteboards, how we use them and how successfully. I taught, I heard a lot of, uh, uh, we have some preschool. So we just do green dot, red dot, okay? Yes, no. This way that takes away that whiteboard marker and that extra, the motor skills that aren't developed, they don't get in the way. As we get into uh, reception year ones, they have the yes or just a B written on that or no. The key to the usage of our whiteboards is the student justifying their answer, defending their answer, explaining their answer. Very short answers. We don't want them writing out long answers because it'll take my pace. It'll take my, uh, my uh, learning episode. I have to be very conscious of the learning episode attention span that I have for specific year levels. And then lastly, complete sentences. Students are always answering in complete sentences. They're always justifying and they're always using the new academic vocabulary being taught, specifically the content vocabulary. What is the concept? So if I'm teaching engagement as the concept, student engagement, every answer, I do student engagement because, complete sentences help me with student engagement because, uh, context clue, it's an example of a context clue because, it's a two-step equation because, okay? This develops language, language, oral language, transfer to reading comprehension, and speaking in complete sentences also transfers into writing. So we want to develop that. In fact, um, you know, that's one of the barriers sometimes that a learner has. The type of language, the amount of language, low socioeconomic students enter primary, pre-kindergarten compared to middle to high socioeconomic, the difference in language, oral language. How can we support language? Complete sentences is a really important factor in that. So that's student engagement, and that's what <clears throat> we want our students to see, uh, uh, to use, and our teachers to use. Now, explicit direct instruction is huge in Australia, well, not huge, <laughs> the 
explicit instruction has become a very generic term in Australia. And in fact, I come to Australia consistently and schools will tell me, look, we are on the explicit instruction journey. Uh, where are we from here? And the number one, the first thing um, I look at is how well has the school adopted our engagement norm? How well are we engaging our students with the engagement norms you've seen? Next, I look for TAPL. Do teachers teach first? Do they ask questions? Uh, then uh, pair, share, pick of non-volunteer. Do they understand TAPL? You saw an example of TAPL when I showed you the one-step equation. I taught number one, so you could do number two. You're going to see an example of TAPL in a second. And then also, lastly, but just as important to anything, what type of questions are my teachers asking this, are the teachers asking their students? Okay, if they're not higher order questions, it is not the pedagogy we develop. And in fact, what I tend to see is a lot of recall questions in explicit instruction. In fact, I've seen a kind of a hybrid. Uh, it's a good example would be the warm ups or daily reviews, which are very important. And we need those rehearsals and we need those repetitions. But the warm-ups and daily reviews are not EDI that we develop because it's just recall. They're just, okay, context clues. They're just saying definitions. They're just saying to get those definitions in your head. So I'm very careful when a teacher asks a student, <clears throat> what's a character I just taught you? And a student says, a character is a person and a more thing in a story. And it talks or does something. Perfect recall. I'm like, well, wait a second. No, no, no. Why is that a character? What is it doing and what else would it have to do? Okay, and you'll see examples right now of, of, what we, of what we teach. So the type of questions we're asking our students is extremely important for it to be our true pedagogy. And we're not gonna get into it today, uh, but that's the information processing mo uh, model. We're looking at how we move information from sensory memory into working memory. To do that, we need multimedia experiences. We need a lot of attention, rehearsal, mnemonics, and through visual and auditory stimuli. Those are our engagement norms. Track with me, read with me, pair sharing, gestures, uh, 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 examples. And once we're in working memory, how do we get it into long-term memory? With complex tasks and higher order thinking. And the students do complex tasks justifying. Now this, is all, why are we so big on this? Because this is Bloom's taxonomy. We're very strong and believe in, in this is how well or deep of an understanding a learner has on a concept, okay? What level of questionings are teachers asking? The lower levels, remember, is just to memorize or repeat. So when students are just repeating definitions, they're at a very low level of Bloom's taxonomy. That is not true understanding of that concept. Not just yet, though it is important. Uh, we need fluency and understand, can they explain? Can they identify? Can they recognize? We are much, we, we, we are interested in these top four, okay? These top four <laughs> apply. Can they implement? Can they solve? Can they demonstrate? Analyze. Can they differentiate? Can they compare and contrast? Can they distinguish? Can they organize? Evaluate? Can they argue? Can they defend? Can they judge, select, and finally create? Can they design, assemble, construct, and conjecture? So those are the types of questions we want our teachers to ask, but it's tough for teachers to know well, what level of blooms am I teaching? Well, we want your teachers, we've trained them, we've synthesized Bloom for you. If your teachers are asking these eight questions, and really it's just the top six, they're doing Blooms. Which is an example of a character, how do you know? Why is the monkey playing a guitar, and you're gonna see this lesson in a second, why is the monkey playing a guitar an example of a character? Why is the park not an example of a character? Compare and contrast. How do the example of the non-example differ? Give me an example of a character. Create non-example of a character. So we've synthesized Bloom's. So let me show you a quick section of Tapple. 
you know, I think I'm going to do reception because I looked at the numbers. We have a lot of um, preschool and primary. This is usually a reception year one. So this is the example I can show right now. I want you to take a note. I want you to think, what engagement norms am I using? I want you to think, what types of question am I expecting my students to answer? Um, and right now, you are my reception year one age students. Even this can be done for uh, preschool age students as well. Um, OK, so this is what a lesson would look like. And this is concept development. One gesture I want you to leave with, concept development. We're always doing this in EDI. Academic definition. Everyone please do that. Academic definition. Academic definition. Multiple examples, possible non-examples, higher order question. Definition, academic definition, multiple examples, non-examples, higher order question. I'm doing this in high school. I'm doing this in middle school. I'm doing any concept. I have an academic definition and it looks something like this. All right, class, my turn. Track with me. A character is a person, animal, or thing in a story. Read with me. A character is a person, animal, or thing in a story. Academic definition, track with me, read with me. Here's a cognitive. Class, here's how I remember this. A character is a person because I'm a person, or animal because animals have funny ears, or thing in a story. But there's something else we have to know. Track with me, characters talk or do something. Read with me, characters talk or do something. Oh, let's remember that, characters talk. See, I'm talking, and characters do something. See, they do something, something that a person would do. Academic definition with cognitive strategies. Now let's try examples. All right, I'll read first. One day, a little girl named Josie was crying at the park. Read with me. One day, a little girl named Josie was crying at the park. This is my example, explain why. Josie is a girl, she's a little girl, and she's crying, she's, so she's doing something that a person does. Josie is a character in this little story. She lost her ball, your turn, she lost her ball. Oh wait, I have a, let's get ready to show a dancing frog voice. I'm gonna do it first, track with me. The dancing frog said, I have a gift for you, Josie. Your turn, the dancing frog said, I have a gift for you, Josie. Oh, oh my goodness, I have a frog, he's an animal, and he's dancing. Everyone dance, show me your dance. He's doing something that a person would do, but he's also talking, I have a gift for you, Josie. That dancing frog is a character in my story. It was a new ball. Your turn, it was a new ball. Oh, wait a second, I have some things in the story, they're things, but they're not characters, so we have to be careful. We have a ball, it's a thing, but it doesn't talk or it doesn't do something that a person does. Oh, but a ball will bounce and I can kick. Yeah, it bounces, but it needs to do something that a person does or talk like a person. And I have a gift. Gift is a thing, but it needs to talk or do something like a person does. Oh, but I opened a gift. Oh, no, no, did it talk or did it do something like uh, have a tea party with the ball. Now that's what we have to look for. We're clearing misconceptions. That's why we need non-examples sometimes. <laughs> Academic definition, examples, non-examples. That was tapple. That's the T in that, that, not that wasn't tapple. That's the T in tapple. I just taught the concept. Now all my students have a chance to answer the question. Can the monkey be a character in a story? Explain. This is the key to our question. Explain, okay? Can the monkey be a character? Talk to your partner, okay? And we even teach preschool age students and foundation reception age students how to how to explain to each other. And then I see decisions, yes. And then some will have no. And we teach teachers how to make decisions. For example, I have a Kath and Alana, Karen and Nick, and the Ross group. That's it's hard to see. Kath and Alana. Give me a thumbs up for yes. Karen and Nick, give me a thumbs up for yes, just so everyone can have the visual. Karen and Nick, um, I see that. And uh, Ross group, thumbs down for no, just so everyone. We have a misconception. I do not call on my wrong answer first, but I want my other kid, instead, instead of just telling Ross the answer, I let Kath and Karen tell them the answer. 
Kath and Alana are my high performing students. Karen and Nick are middle performing. So I even make a decision. I go to Karen and Nick middle performing first to see their, their thought process. Can you tell me why you chose, yes, this is a character? Oh, yeah, it's a character because it's an animal, monkeys are animal. Then I echo, yes, it's a monkey, which is an animal. What else is, what's it doing? Oh, it's playing a guitar like a person would play. Yes, this is doing something that a person does. So that could be a character in my story. Now, how do I differentiate with a Kath and Alana who are, at a high, uh, uh, who are high performing? Now I can go and challenge them at the same time for Ross's benefit. Kath, Alana, you also said, yes, this is a character. Um, why do you think it's a character? Oh, it's a character because it's an animal and it's doing something that a person does. What else could that monkey do in a story that would do be a character? And she back. It would have to talk. Yes. And if it also talked, it would be a character. Then I can go to a Ross. Ross, would you like to change your answer or would you be confident enough to tell me the misconception? Okay. And by that time, that Ross group or student has heard the right answer. Those are the repetitions and exposures I'm trying to get to. So we do this and we, and I've, I've gone beyond my time. I'm very sorry. I had a lot of information and I was a few minutes late because I had technical difficulties, but I just want to show you the slide. I'm doing the same thing with high school age students. The same thing. I have a definition. I track with me, read with me this definition. I have multiple visual examples where I will show students what a reactant is, what the model, this is a reaction. And then I can ask a higher order question, which is an example of a reactant? How do you know? The non-examples is product. That's EDI. Okay. Anyway, those are our engagement norms. Those are some of the strategies. The reason I show you this is because as an as a administrator, you need to be able to see these strategies in play and give the feedback to the specific feedback to your teacher. Um, I will end, I've gone past my time. I'm very sorry about that. I was a little bit rushed with the information I wanted to give across, but I did want you to see a tidbit and a very tiny tip of the iceberg of what the pedagogy is, all right? Um, Ross, I'd like, uh, I don't know if you wanna close this with a questions or what the time constraints are. Um. Yeah, if you can all hear me. Um, I'm very happy if uh, leaders have any questions. Uh, Joe, that was, uh, you provided so much clarity and the way you brought the examples in and modelled it has been fabulous. And the way you've targeted it for um, leaders who've got preschools right through now to our latest secondary example has just been fabulous. Um, my let team's been going, yes, yes, hearing about grade level cons, um, content and being able to still teach concepts at grade level, even if kids can't read at that level. Uh, we just found ourselves um, nodding so often um, and, you know, you, you've been reiterating messages that we've been sharing with our leaders. But very happy if there's anyone with a question out there to ask Joe. And I'm here. Um, I, I'm very available. And I, again, I apologize for going past my allotted time because I do respect the times that, that you have. But thank you for joining me. Any questions or feedback at all? Yeah, Joe, I've got a question. Um, yes. PSG Amos at Harrowful Gardens High School. What okay. experience do you have with um, high school age students doing the reading with and, um, you know, those sorts of things. So we, we use pair share and all of those sorts of things quite regularly, but we mm -hmm. might modify it. So we might read a word, a technical word rather than a whole sentence or something like that. So what, what do you do? That's exactly right. And we talk a lot. Remember, this will look differently. Um, now the strategies, if I have students that are reading at grade level, I don't need to track with me, read with me. I'll just correlate read the learning objective together because we do need that multiple pathway to the brain. So I'll explain to them. And I do need to read that new word because it's usually new content specific word, especially in science or mathematics, Pythagorean theorem, even conservate. So we'll pronounce it the one word or two that, that they will not, that they will have problems with. But there are some high school students that do benefit. Now you got to keep in mind, even in high school, 
um, though 80 or 90% of your students might be able to read the definition, there will be some who cannot. So even when I track with me, read with me, there's two purposes. Everyone is hearing it, my non-readers hearing it out loud, and then all of them can read successfully. Uh, so I keep that in mind sometimes, but I'm very selective of what I do track with me, read with me. And, you know, we talk a lot about um, giving your students metacognition. Why do we do each strategy? What is the benefit? I get a literally I give them the workshop I'm giving you. We track with we pronounce with me for this reason. This is why we pair share all those 15 reasons. So that's why we want to get them on board. And sometimes it's hard if if they haven't done this style of teaching their whole academic career. It's a it's a little bit of a shift, but I can see that implementation work. And it, it really is that relationship that teacher has with the students, especially if they're giving them metacognition this is why we're doing this this is to support your reading and wow and you do have to be selective so yeah that's the modifying of what it would look like differently for year ones year four or even this year sevens different classes some might need more reading support than others and the hand gestures so the gestures look they must be um in high school so early childhood 70% of my lessons, I can come up with gestures because the concepts aren't as difficult. Uh, so 70%, uh, and, and I, you can be more animated. As I get in, into upper primary, I'm looking at 50%. And then lastly, for high school, it's maybe 30% of my lessons. I just can't come up with that many gestures because the, um, the um, concepts become more sophisticated. But if I do, they're very simple. But instead of gestures, we talk a lot about a lot of different cognitive strategies like manipulatives, like word morphology, for example, equation. Let's all underline equa. Equa means equal, okay? So that's how I know equation one side. So we talk a lot, we, we do need to think of cognitive strategies. Gestures, we don't have as many and we simplify them. And again, I explain that to my students. I'm like, this is a way for you to remember more especially if you're a kinesthetic learner who needs movement. You give them constant... There you go, one question. How do you find high school students re, um, respond to being asked to make the gestures? Mm -hmm. Well, if they can create the gestures, it's powerful. Okay. And again, look, I've been at a high school and it was the same school and in one classroom, the students were on board and they were successful. They were pair sharing. And this teacher was just had a great relationship with her staff, with, with her students. And I went in the same high school to a different classroom with a different teacher. And the kids didn't want to do anything because yeah. the teacher didn't <laughs> have them buy in, you know, and she yeah. didn't, you know, bring her passion to it. And the reason, and it's yeah. like, oh, these kids, she was already, that person was already oh, against this isn't going to work and you know it's like look can you explain to them why we're doing it and you do have to make it age appropriate um and that's you know we do much more pair sharing and much more you know collaboration type pieces i won't lose the battle on the gestures and there's only going to be a few here and there okay Hi. all right uh anyone else okay we've um that i usually allow three seconds joe um uh, again, for all the reasons I gave a few minutes ago, that you know, I was um, a little bit nervous about how this would work with so many people. Um, you know, we've had uh, at one stage 32 participants. A couple have sent me a message to say they've just left to go to another meeting. But uh, the way you did it, I can't believe an hour and a half has gone by. Uh, can't thank you enough for this.